really exciting stuff. And I'm showing some of the video on the screen here. You can see um, that as you move uh, the objects around, the camera will uh, change its confidence value on that as well. Hey friends, what's up? This is CloudBard here. It's Tuesday. I'm out here at reInvent here in Las Vegas. Had a great time yesterday, so it was Monday. Uh, started my day out with a streaming Kafka services workshop. Pretty cool stuff. We got to take a look at um, using Mirror Maker to keep an existing Kafka stream running and then synchronize the transition over to AWS MSK or managed streaming for Kafka. Now this is a pretty exciting little service here. I love working with uh, streaming event data. And one of the cool things to kind of keep in mind about streams versus queues is to remember that a queue is typically one-to-one, -one, one message, one consumer. Whereas a stream is kind of more of a live interaction where you could have multiple different uh, consumers reading the same streaming events in concurrency and in parallel. So that really changes some of the ways that we can process data. It was also really cool to see uh, yet another interesting kind of migration and cutover trick and some of the cool tooling that works around that. So I had a great time at that workshop. Also got to chat with some other Kafka users who are excited about uh, seeing new advancements in the uh, managed streaming for Kafka service at AWS. So cool stuff there. Uh, the other one then is after that, I went into a workshop on AWS account management practices. And I was really impressed with this one. Uh, I have a lot of experience with the account management side of things. I've worked with organizations quite a bit um, in managing AWS accounts. So I was pretty familiar with what they were trying to uh, articulate here, but what they did a really great job with uh, was the way that the session was put together. Um, as a trainer, I always think about lesson presentation and how to make uh, the most impactful learning experience, and they did a great job of this. They started out by saying, okay, uh, imagine that you need to go through and clean out all of the resources in an AWS account. What would be the first thing you would do? And we're all like, okay, well, first we'd have to figure out what we need to clean up so that we know that we can go and clean it up. He's like, okay, so five minute challenge, go and find as many of the resources as you can in your account uh, right now in this demo account that we gave you. <laughs> it was a great example. So there we are all kind of struggling around to try to figure out, first of all, how would you inventory the account and find all of the information inside of it and the resources that you need to target for removal? So that was a big exercise in <laughs> frustration and futility and it was exactly their point. So after that, he said, okay, great. So you maybe you found five or 10 of them. Show me how you would go through and delete all of those resources. And so this illustrated another part of the problem. First is the scope issue. The second part is the logistics of actually trying to go through and remove all of these resources. They had given us like maybe 20 resources to try to discover and delete. Of course, it was hard to do. We couldn't get them cleaned up. And ultimately, we didn't have much confidence that our accounts were completely uh, wiped out. So um, to kind of put this in context, imagine that you wanted to let uh, users work with AWS accounts as a part of a lab or a proof of concept or a demonstration or a sandbox or maybe for certain types of testing purposes. The problem behind it then is, uh, sure, you can create the resources as an automated fashion, but going through and cleaning an account out to the absolute pristine beginning point, it's a logistical nightmare. And so ultimately, um, as they went farther through the workshop, we started talking about how it's important to plan in advance for the idea of managing your accounts. In the end, we went over and talked a lot about organizations, service control policies, um, how we can use those pieces to help kind of control the scope of what people can create in the first place. And then that makes it a lot easier for us to use tools like uh, AWS Nuke or some of these other cleaning services that are available out there kind of in the third party world to go through and remove resources. Along the way, we also talked about things like Lambda state engine and step functions uh, being a great way to kind of orchestrate multiple different Lambda functions that are designed for cleaning up and iterating through a variety of different resources in your AWS account. So pretty slick stuff. In the end, it was a great demonstration. I had a great time at the workshop. Also chatted with a lot of my peers at the table there. Um, a lot of us have done a lot of hand-rolled scripting over the years, and it's effective. And we all agreed that it's effective because we know what we're trying to remove. And this was one of the things the guys were trying to impress upon us was that, uh, uh, what about unpredictable things? If you want to let somebody play with an AWS account, then they're going to get in there. They're going to make things that maybe were outside of the scope that you thought. So start first with that scope and then develop the automated tools that can effectively clean those pieces up. So after all the excitement on Monday, I also got to hang out with the CBT Nuggets developer and DevOps teams. Really great time getting to see all those folks there. It's awesome. Uh, I mean, of course, I trained for AWS uh, on CBT Nuggets there. And 
uh, we're a customer too. I mean, all of our streaming media, all of that uh, content generation, the metadata parts of it, a lot of our reporting, uh, most of those pieces are running in Amazon Web Services. So really, CBT Nuggets is almost completely all in uh, infrastructure-wise um, on the cloud side of it and with Amazon Web Services. So this is another one of the things that I love about working with CBT is that we really do we do use the services, and it's a big part of uh, of how we get these content made for you guys, and so you can come watch in our catalog. Something that I hope to be able to talk about a lot more uh, in the weeks and months ahead, I want to do some little showcase bits about how CBT Nuggets uses AWS. But today is Tuesday, and I just got back from the Andy Jazzy uh, keynote um, address. Whoa, all sorts of great announcements that came out. Uh, machine learning, AI, all sorts of cool SageMaker workbooks that are coming up. Uh, managed Cassandra databases, uh, new instance types for, in, uh, what was it, Inferentia, I believe, for uh, doing a machine learning inference uh, instances targeted at that. Really exciting stuff. Um, the other part that I thought was interesting was some of the new features that they added to S3. Uh, in fact, just trying to remember it all right now, I'm feeling overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back through my notes um, and do a more in-depth recap on all the announcements that came out this morning. The other thing that I got to do today, which was something that I was really excited about, um, was talk about sustainability and ecology, okay? Uh, and kind of just greening up the data center, greening up the tech space, and bringing that discussion out. Last night, um, for Peter DeSantis, for the Monday Night Live, uh, Peter DeSantis is the infrastructure um, lead at AWS, and so he was talking about this exact thing, and I was really thrilled. First, he started off talking about high-performance computing and the impact that that has on um, advanced predictive engines, in particular, things like weather prediction. So interesting things to kind of consider there. He was kind of setting the stage for some of the roles that AWS plays uh, in kind of the larger ecosystem of world services. After that, he got into talking about global footprint, the data centers that AWS uses, and brought up this great sustainability conversation. So one of the big things that happened recently is that Jeff Bezos set up a program with a number of other businesses called the uh, Climate Pledge. And essentially, the Climate Pledge is uh, kind of in parallel with the Paris Climate Agreement, which basically says that by, I think it's 2050, um, organizations are going to seek to be zero carbon or absolutely offsetting anything that can't be completely reduced. So uh, Amazon is actually taking on the challenge of trying to beat that deadline by 10 years. Um, so they actually laid out their plan for how they would improve uh, to 80% and then to 100% complete offset on it. And the other part that goes along with the Climate Pledge is that organizations that choose to be a part of the Climate Pledge, they're agreeing to report on their carbon footprint regularly um, and to take specific actionable steps to reduce their carbon footprint um, and when not possible, to offset it with credits. So this was really great. It was exactly the sort of thing that I was looking for um, to see uh, something like AWS, uh, to see AWS try to reach out and really kind of you know, tip their hat to this subject matter because it's crucial. And if you took a look at some of the pieces that I was chatting about in my other videos about um, the green data center initiatives that are out there, like Paul Johnston's projects, um, this was great. And I hope that it's partially because of the result that people are asking for and looking at these large industry leaders to try to make an impact on it. And again, this is something that's really important to me. So this all set up a great conversation that I had, and it's my final little piece for my Tuesday update before I get back out and go to a, another workshop session here. Um, the final thing was that uh, after my little keynote session, I went down into the AWS Builders Fair here in the Aria and got to chat with two really awesome builder projects. Now, if you're not familiar with the Builders Fair, the, basically the idea is that Amazon uh, employees or AWS employees are encouraged to create projects. And uh, they use the fun term, they called it um, sharpening the sword. The basic idea is to get their staff to use these services in applied ways so that they get more feedback out of it. It's a great part of the, the testing and improvement life cycle. So the first one that I got to chat with was um, Janos and Kapil, and these guys have designed a uh, artificial intelligence and image recognition tool. I believe they're using SageMaker as a part of it to go through and look at images of uh, coral reefs where fish are swimming around and look for trash that's floating in the water or in the area. And so this is a pretty simple little concept. They're trying to find the um, foreign objects that are in these natural places so that we can easily go and clean them up. Really exciting stuff. And I'm showing some of the video on the screen here. You can see um, that as you move uh, the objects around, the camera will change its confidence value on that as well. 
So pretty interesting application here. And you can imagine that if we apply that to underwater scenarios, we can apply it to other scenarios where we're cleaning up garbage, uh, maybe in uh, more terrestrial locations instead of things underwater. Now I wanted to share with you some of the conversations that I had with Janos and Kapil, and also a friend Yasi who stopped by there who was chatting and excited about the project as well. Yeah, so hey friends, uh, Cloudbart here. I'm just chatting at the uh, reInvent Builders Fair. I'm here with Kapil and uh, Janos and Yasi. Don't you leave, buddy. I was like, I don't want to mess up your video. You're all right. You're here. That's yeah, why not? It's just a fun one. So I was just really excited because this is the kind of uh, project that I'm really interested in bringing more news to. So I was just chatting with Jan uh, Janos and Kapil about how they got started. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about how AWS encourages the teams to build internally there, like you were just saying? Yeah, sure. So uh, we go through the solutions after this, uh, and uh, about 20% of our work involves using our own technology to create something. So that could be our own pet project, an idea that we come up with. So we came up with this idea of uh, there's a lot of trash in our ocean. How can we use technology to help with the cleanup effort? So that, that's how it all came together. Yeah. And I'm a fashion scuba diver, so I have actually interest in that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you can hook it up to your goggles so you have a little camera that detects it as you Yeah, but the problem is, is uh, so scuba divers or uh, dive centers are doing cleanup sessions, but uh, they are going blind in, right? So uh, they don't know where the trash is. Uh, with this technology, maybe we can help them to get more targeted. Uh, uh, it sends you in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. That's amazing. So the way the system works is you've got a camera that looks at the scene, and you're using what services to interpret that? Yeah, we're using SageMaker. Basically, we trained a custom model using SageMaker, and we've trained it to detect uh, pin cans and plastic bags for now, and of course, uh, fish as well. Uh, so the idea is to uh, deploy that model in an uh, underwater drone, uh, which has a camera. And then uh, when the drone goes around swimming, it will bring back the footage, we analyze the footage, and we also track the location of the drone at the same time. So then we can create like a geolocation map uh, of where is uh, most of the trash in the ocean. You're also able to count the fish that are in the area as well, so you're getting that info also if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, no, but uh, that's the next thing. Oh, it can use, it's a quick jump from here to there. You can detect yeah. rare fish and all that kind of stuff. So it's exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah diversity counts. Yeah. 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 Wow, there's a lot of potential for that. Yeah, absolutely. So you were thinking a drone could have this on them and they could cruise and like chart an area out and then maybe yeah. if it doesn't gather it themselves, others could come back and collect it or maybe a combination of yeah, or even yeah. having a drone with an arm that could pull it out. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the technology, I think, for uh, underwater drones is not there yet. Uh, it's quite uh, difficult. Um, having light, light problems, uh, having uh, power problems. How, how do you transmit and how do you operate on the water? Uh, so there's a lot of things that we still need to solve on the water drones. What about the location? The location? Yeah, so GPS doesn't work. Right, that's what I thought. I'm thinking of the satellite yeah. out. So if you had, what if you had an overwater drone that had something in the water? Exactly. So oh, yeah. there's drones that have a beacon on top, uh, which you can use, and also the signal then with Wi-Fi. Oh, so like yeah. 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 It's a lot of yeah. 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 moving parts. Yeah. Yeah. So that is really cool. Very, very cool. And that is awesome. Well, Kapil and Janos and Yasi, thanks for chatting, buddy. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys are interested in getting involved in the Builders Fair, you can look us up online at reInvent. I'll share some links. And you guys are on LinkedIn as well. Yes. Um, big shout out to AWS Cloud for making it possible for their staff and for me and folks at reInvent to get excited about projects like this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Enjoy the event. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so if you're interested in these Builders Fair projects, uh, I will share the links there and then in their description. You can go and vote on them um, or just share the videos around so that others can see some of the exciting things that are happening out there. Really want to see uh, more of this sort of technology um, taking off. And the other team that I got to chat with was uh, Tiago and Nicolas. And these guys were from, I believe they're from Brazil. And what they're doing is they're working on a recycling sorting machine that can look at both the images that it's seeing of the trash and also it can key off of the sound, and they're even trying to develop some other um, additives in there where it could actually detect the material that it's made out of. So I thought this was really cool. And beyond that, they built this awesome machine, and I'm showing it here on the screen. Uh, and what it does is you drop the trash or the recyclable in, it takes a picture of it, 
and it runs it through the image recognition uh, training that they've done in the background, and it makes a guess based on what it looks at in the shape um, and other characteristics of it. And this is where they were saying they were talking about adding the audio piece, because when you drop paper or drop plastic or drop a tin can, the sound that it makes is pretty indicative. And so that could increase the confidence in the sorting mechanisms itself. Pretty slick stuff. So image plus audio uh, plus material uh, composition detection, something they were talking about adding earlier, uh, later on in the process as well. So the idea would be to take this and go even farther out into larger industrial versions of this where we could maybe sort through hundreds to thousands of items a minute um, using this sort of technology. And this was kind of relevant to me because when I was home over the holidays, I was hearing families talking about how their recycling programs are kind of starting to go, they're kind of beginning to stink in a lot of areas. Uh, it's hard to find something that they can do with the resources and it's difficult for them to justify the time spent to sort and manage all of that recyclable. So, Something like what uh, Nicolas there and Tiago were working on could be a great way to hopefully uh, address some of the recyclability issues that we're having out there. Now keep in mind, friends, uh, the old adage is reduce, reuse, and recycle. That's the last one. <laughs> so the original goal was to try to reduce the consumption and then try to improve the reusability parts of it. And then finally, recycle as a last resort. So a lot of interesting pieces coming together here at reInvent this week, 2019. I'm gonna keep the story up. This afternoon, I'm gonna go into a little IoT session. Got a little chalk talk and some workshops I'm gonna be getting into there because I've kind of gotten into the IoT scene quite a bit and enjoying that. So more information coming up for everybody there as well. The other part that I'm gonna be looking at this week, tomorrow I'll be doing the backpack stuffing project um, for the Kids for Hunger program here in Las Vegas. Another interesting charitable event here at the reInvent uh, sessions. So I'll be sure to provide you some coverage about that. And until then, my friends, hang tight and I'll see you in the club.